And uh, we have one more aperitif before uh, lunch in the form of uh, Victor Vigna. And I have found his biography, so I can tell you that he's an interaction designer with studios at London's Royal College of Art. He's talked and researched, researched in different centers in Europe, Latin America, and Asia, and that's got to be good for anybody, hasn't it? To get those cultural perspectives. And his, his work sort of, uh, is at the intersection between research into design, digital crafts, open networks and practices, and really important questions, social implications of all that. So please welcome uh, Victor Vigna, and I hope I've said your surname correctly. Victor. Also the other, the other speakers, I think, have been um, very transparent days. So today, um, I also wanted to talk about open design, um, do it yourself, do it with others, name it as you like. And I'm going to be talking about four different topics or chapters, everyday solutions, share knowledge, grassroots innovations, innovations that happen at the base of the environment, and also collaborative networks. And I would like to see how actually these creative practices, these production models, um, might be an alternative to traditional consumer markets, traditional as we understand it in the Western context. And the way to reflect on these practices, I would like to be able to see how they somehow uh, spontaneously take place in informal economies. So we'll be looking at a few examples from Colombia, where they call it Rebusque, Brazil, or Gambiarra, Yugar in India, or the culture of Shansai in China. A little bit about do it yourself. Um, if you look at how, how it started, this is popular mechanics from the beginning of the century, I think it's where they really start to do this process of popularizing science, but also this idea of, of people being able to, to create solutions you know, for their own needs, combining you know, different resources, different mechanisms and parts, and also this idea of, of hacking, of upgrading a specific artifact in order to perform um, in a more efficient manner. So these two ideas, are, I think, already start to incorporate uh, two important key points in my talk. The idea of combining different resources together, or the idea of bricolage, and also the idea of repairing, of amateur, of doing it at home, of doing it yourself. And obviously this took a completely different direction, I think, after the World War, uh, the Second World War, a lot of veterans, um, an ex-official, would go back to the United States and they had nothing to do. So all this um, culture of repair that it was really commodified, also with the introduction on, 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 on the drill machine, it was the first, the first fabricator, really personal fabricator, almost looking, at, um, looking like, a, like a gun. And you know, that has taken us to this, to this part you know, of doing it yourself. I'm not really interested on, on this side of, of, of doing it yourself, of bricolage, if you like. Um, in my practice, um, I've had the opportunity to, to collaborate with different academic institutions in Europe. Um, also, um, often in, um, here in Barcelona, at Elisaba, in the Fab Lab that um, Thomas Diaz presented yesterday, for some time also in Latin America, in, in Bogotá, Medellín, uh, Sao Paulo for a short while, and lately in Bangalore, um, often also teaching kids in a way, you know, how to experiment with technology, how to recycle objects to, to, to make uh, new things. This is also from the booklet of Arduino. So as an interaction designer, I also work with physical computing, and very often you don't have the resources in academic context. And you really need to, to, to take advantage, to maximize the resources that you might have at hand. That was a quote from Usman Haq. Um, this is just a very short collection of examples where you can see, for instance, a CD tray you know, um, hacked you know, in order to perform a different function. And this football had a cappuccino shaker in order to celebrate the goals. So after the reason to, to, to use this approach is because you really have very little, very little means. It's much easier you know, to get something that is broken. This was a um, um, garden of um, environmental flowers made for teenagers in Dakar, or insect, insects rea reacting to, um, to the light. Quite often, these physical computing experiments and works are aimed to create uh, different experiences, you know, different, different ways of interacting with physical objects. Um, 
Um, this was a printer that became a um, man orchestra. Or, uh, <laughs> Um, tape player operated, and some, um, sometimes also, you know, the, the idea is also to create uh, custom fabrication robots. That was in the context also of Iac and, and Marta Malé. As you see here, this, this was an old printer, and I think the last one it was a plotter that became um, a prototype for a weaver, right? So, in the context of, of my practice, you know, I could kind of identify these kind of design principles or strategies, which is what I will what I will be talking about today. Maximize available resources, reappropriate existing technologies, integrate different parts and components, and develop iterative, non optimal, good enough solution. That's at the end idea of a prototype. So, how does this relate to informal economies? I think informal economies is very creative practice in a way or another. Um, this is in Medellin, as I mentioned, they call it Rebusque. You can find people on the streets providing all kinds of services. This guy uh, types letters, fills his applications for you. Um, um, with the machine, um, I'll mention it at the end of the talk, and I think it will be maybe relevant for what we have been discussing here. So, um, this, this culture you know, of informal economy, I think um, uh, it really it applies creativity in a way you know, to, to keep them active, included, productive. It's a service-based survival economy and when you, when you start to look you know, at the typologies of, it, of this type of activities and the creativity you know, behind it, uh, you start to find some really amazing practices like the idea of mobile sharing you know, of Colombia and other countries of Latin America. People who actually have a lot of different cell phones uh, with uh, flat rate plans and they share it with you, they rent it with you at a nominal price. Uh, you can notice on the screen that um, actually the, the cell phones are chained to the owners so people don't, don't run away with them. And informal economies also take place in markets. I like going to markets with the students because that's where we get our raw material. And in emerging countries, obviously, the culture of recycling is very, very developed. You find literally hundreds of stands in this market in Medellin selling all kinds of, of junk and also the devices. And they're very specialized. You can find anything from shakers to skates. Um, and when you start to pay attention, you really start to find some unique things. Like if you notice in the picture, the lady has used a telephone cord in order to keep her lighter from, from being stolen. And in a way, you know, I think there was something interesting there, you know, this kind of um, creativity applied to create everyday solutions, which will be the first chapter of my talk. This is a speed road in Bangalore. It's a very long street. You can find anything here from microchips to pump uh, pieces. They, they say that you can really almost buy, uh, make a rocket out of what you can find in a speed road. And there's also this culture, you know, where you can find almost any kind of electronic component <laughs> in second hand or new. And also a lot of high, very high, um, um, really skilled technologists um, working at the street level that, that maybe can change the screen of your mobile phone. You can take them an um, electronic circuit sketch on a paper and, you know, a few hours later, you know, they will give it back to you. So it's this really um, a strange combination of high tech and low tech at the same time. So it's a very crowded country on one side, a lot of very good people, but on the other side, a lot of very skilled technologies, really trying to, to create solutions to any problem that you can imagine. And again, when you start to pay attention, you really find some very beautiful design solutions um, to overcome you know, everyday, kind of, everyday kind of problems. Some of them just plain practical and useful, some of them really, really ugly, but still practical, and some of them are very, very innovative and amazing. <laughs> So this is the idea of Jugat. You know, the idea of Jugat is really overcoming constraints, improvising an effective solution. It really started um, from the idea of vehicles um, in the rural areas, you know, where they would adapt a hydraulic pump to make a you know, car and so on. But now it's, it's, it's really expanded to a way of life, you know, to a way of approaching you know, your, your everyday needs. This is part of the research with my students there. You know, she was um, a balloon seller. And we noticed you know, the, the, the pump that she was using. And, when we when we inquire her, you know, about the, the the origin of the of these very beautifully crafted objects, she told us that she had made it herself with materials that she had found around the market. And the only thing that she couldn't do that it was actually attaching, fixing the rubber to the wooden pieces, she took it to a shoemaker nearby. You know? So again, if you think about this, you know, she's really using these kind of principles. Again, maximizing available resources, reutilizing materials and components employing durable and robust connections, outsourcing production when needed. So I started to think that really this lady was working 
in the same way that I was, you know, in my, in my academic practice, she's also a maker, she's also, you know, kind of on the same line of work. I found this picture in Flickr, um, it's a um, sound system. In Brazil they call this cambiarra, it's the, the, maybe the, the way, you know, in, maybe in Spain here we could say chapuza, but I think cambiarra goes beyond this. Um, Gabriel Menotti actually at the, the talk at Miguel Andrado uh, gave a very good definition. You know, he calls a dysfunctional artifact. It's the idea that it, it, it's born from, from, from deception and failure. You really have to fix things in order to make them work. And it has created a whole culture of, of, of remixing and re reutilizing and combining different technologies with its own aesthetics and so on. Um, this is a picture from, from Fred Paulino Cambio Ciclo. It's, we'll see many, many different bicycles throughout the presentation. Second chapter, as you know, open knowledge. You know, how, how that is happening? This is from um, um, a telecentro in Carandiru. Uh, it was um, an old bridge in San Paolo, now it's a big social center. And there is a group working there called Meta Reciclage, led by Felipe Fonseca. And what they do basically is that they collect obsolete computers, you know, donated by companies and the state and so on. And they teach teenagers, you know, how to put them together in order to create cyber cafes. Um, so, um, this word from Felipe, you know, Brazil is really, you know, they really have a lot of connectivity, you know, at the same time it's hyper-connected and precarious, you know, but at the same time, you know, they have a lot of very online social skills, they have very accessible technology, they have a lot of cheap connectivity, and for me this is really a, a way to understand open design, we are not only teaching people, you know, how to create these kind of social platforms, you know, through the transmission of knowledge, but you're also creating something that can expand and can evolve over time. This is again from Felipe, his principles, uh, recycled products, methods, strategies, everything can be recycled. Share generated knowledge, allow free distribution and modification, reappropriate, reinvent, occupy, reply, keep recycling forever. I think it really makes sense as well. This is Arvind Gupta, I met him a few years ago, and he's dedicated all his life to create educational toys out of trash, and he travels around India, you know, um, different schools, making workshops and teaching people. He has a website called Toys from Trash, and he's published more than 800 educational experiments, I'm um, sure a few of them. So he's very critical with consumerism and the idea that packaging and waste, plastic waste in particular, is creating a very um, um, environmental problem. Um, his experiments go from anything from creating motors, astrological models, uh, simple mechanisms, musical instruments, and so on. Um, this is just a very short example of how to make a pump. And you know, with these very, very um, easy to find components, uh, he makes these instructables, which he also publishes in many different languages and so on as subtitles. You know, and at the end, um, he's really um, opening up a new way of approaching um, um, the making of things, solving your own solutions. Right? So I, uh, I kind of started to understand that uh, with this kind of education, then you really are promoting a culture of of making, of solving your own needs. In the link of a bottle. One would be for the van and the other would be for the bicycle spoke. Now, fix the bicycle spoke to this piston with two nipple nuts. Now this becomes the piston and the connecting rod itself. They take a small bit of the sticky tape and stick part of the tape to itself. In the middle of the, on top of the hole there is no glue. And so this flap can open and close just like a delivery van. Now assemble the pump. You put the piston and the cord rod into the film box and then shut the lid. And now the pump is ready for operation. Place it in a large jug of water and as you Move this so next chapter, um, if you start to consider this as some kind of innovation, could you please take this slide um, down? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's basically innovation which happens at the base of the pyramid, um, very often in, in rural areas and so on. Um, there are many of them which I think are interesting because they are very sustainable. This is a chai cup, it's made of clay and it's disposable. It's actually, um, it doesn't need any energy, it's uh, dried under the sun, so it's very fragile. It doesn't really matter because you drink, you use it um, once or twice, and then you throw it to the, to the floor. 
basically disappears, it comes back to it goes back to earth, you know, after after its use. So it's a very kind of sustainable practice in a way or another. Um, obviously now, you know, with introduction of plastic, it's people is doing the same thing, throwing into the world to the to the floor, which is creating a bigger problem. But there are many practices like this, the use of cotton as fuel, the use of uh, leaves for packaging or kind of um, products and food and so on. Again, the use of organic material in order to create, um, 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 sorry, tableware. Um, the use of organic materials like the tattoo tree in order to keep your clean and teeth clean actually has some antibiotic properties and it's also used for fertilizers and so on. Um, this is a needle gupta, it's not related to the previous gentleman. He has a network called the Honeybee Network and also runs the National Innovation Foundation. And he's also dedicated his life to travel around rural areas in India, identifying these kind of practices and helping, helping to patent, to protect, to, to spread you know, those practices for a, a wider kind of public. So when you combine scarcity of resources, and here we have the key element again, when you don't have too many, too many things, you know, with an abundance of knowledge, sustainable solutions are a common result. At the grassroots, they look for ways to go up nature and conserve energy. Rural innovations tend towards sustainable solutions with frugality, durability, multifunctionality being part of the mix. You know, so it's this idea that when you when you are a producer, but you're also a user, you really care about the environment. This is one of the most famous examples, you know, that he rescued you know, from a village. It's a refrigerator that works with no electricity, it's based on the principle of the Spanish botijo. It has a water chamber at the top, and by evaporation, it keeps the insides cool. Uh, they have made uh, woodwork from uh, clay, which doesn't stick, the gas power, um, press iron, the pressure cooker coffee maker, who, you know, this one in particular has really been a revolution on the streets of the, of the cities in India, where they don't have access to electricity, but they, they can provide their own, their own gas power. One of the most famous ones is the bicycle power um, washing machine. She became very famous. She was also very um, featured in a, in a um, Discovery Channel um, um, short. I won't show it because it's kind of cheesy, but you can find online. But it really shows, you know, that it's really going beyond everyday solutions and trying to, to find um, something bigger. You know. So when you look at principles, safe energy, considered an alternative solutions, combine durability with multifunctionality, promote environmental consciousness, consider the life cycle of the products, and use biodegradable materials. If you think about it, they really make sense also in our context. I think um, this is much more than improvised solutions. I think they could, they could be considered somehow part of this new paradigm of open design that I was introducing yesterday. I think you know that we really you know, have something to learn you know, from these kind of practices. <coughs> Final chapter is about collaborative networks. Um, this is a big electronics market in Shenzhen. Um, I haven't been to Shenzhen, but I have to go to Shanghai in similar markets. Um, there, where really you can find any any uh, any kind of um, electronic component, almost like like candy. You know, you can buy it this by weight. You know, give it two kilos of bread and this and so on. And some very interesting things start to happen. I, I spotted this this. This teenager, um, I'm not sure about her age, but if you can see in the picture, she was designing um, an electronic circuit, a PCB, you know, and, and she was almost doing it like playing a video game, you know. So it really got me thinking, you know, of course, you know, there's a completely different culture of, of electronic production. Um, in these markets, you can also find uh, what they call Shansai mobile phones. Uh, Shansai is a term that stands for out of the market, illegal, it's part of the copycat culture, you know, they are really quick, you know. And they are normally fabricated and produced in very small familiar kind of factories um, uh, that work outside kind of the, the, legal, the, legal, the legal system, sorry. Um, so, you know, these factories, by working outside the dominant infrastructure of mobile producers, you know, they really um, have created, you know, new, um, new products, you know, for low-end low users, you know. So they really have democratized technologies. You know, they sell about 20% of the mobile phones in India, but they also sell in other, you know, the countries in Asia, also in the Middle East, in Latin, in Latin America. Um, I read somewhere, you know, that the Middle East Revolution was actually facilitated by the spread, you know, of these very cheap Shanghai phones. And normally, this this culture is really considered something negative when you think about Chinese production, is where they only copy. But it's actually beyond that. Um, it happens that uh, most of the population here is, is Confucian, 
they, they follow the, the Confucian tradition. And Confucian apparently promotes individual sharing, you know, what they create in the society. And I think that's what's embedded in their own, in their own way of working. Uh, they design nothing from scratch. They really build on what others have done really quickly as well. They also innovate at very small scales. They're able to produce budgets, you know, in the numbers of 1,000, 2,000, you know, they don't really need a big production. That's the reason they, they are able to innovate so quickly. They also share, you know, everything they produce, uh, bill of materials, uh, schematics, and so on. And the reason to do it, I think, is, is double. On one side, if you want to be part of a bigger chain production, you really need to publish what you do. But if you also want to add value to your own process. Um, so this idea of reputation um, within the, the network of production, I think, is also very important. One example from Medellin, this is Moravia, it's one slum, um, so with a very, very long history of tradition. Um, when I was doing free work there, I spotted this, this, this system of um, speakers, and I found out that it was actually a self-regulated communication system set up by the, by the community, by the neighbors, because many of them didn't have phones, you know, and as you see, the slums really spread out all the way to, up to the, to the side of the mountains, and they, you know, everyone is free to use this communication system in order to make any kind of announcement. Maybe your child was lost or you want to ask for a job or whatever, right? The way the communication um, public telephone system in India you know, was also set up in the same way. The government didn't have uh, the ability you know, to reach rural areas, so they collaborated with every citizen. And every citizen actually is taking care of keeping the infrastructure in place, you know, sharing part of the profits you know, of, this, of this network. Another collaborative network that you can find in every city in India is the, the, um, if the iron, if the iron man. Normally you don't, you don't have an iron at home, but this guy will come to your house, you know, once every week or so, and we do the ironing for you. So it's a very sustainable solution. Because it's actually a, an object, a commodity that I, I don't really use every day. And by sharing this kind of ability, then we can start to look at things in a different way. The local production of um, um, fresh lime soda, for instance, is also a very good example. You know. Um, because this is very locally produced, you know, it's very sustainable. The bottle doesn't even have a, a lid, it has a, a marble inside which keeps uh, push with, um, with um, carbonates. Last example, this is a daba or tiffin, it's kind of the Indian tupperware. It has different um, compartments because normally you have the curry at the bottom and then you have the rice and then maybe the chapati and so on. And what happens in Mumbai and other cities is that uh, these guys that are called daba wallas, they will transfer every day, you know, all these little containers, you know, from the periphery, from the suburbs, where the women are cooking, and they will take the lunches, you know, to the to the men, which are working on the on the center of the city. And it is estimated that around 200,000, 300,000 tiffins, you know, dabas, you know, go back and forth every day. So it's a very complex network, you know, that is actually based on a community. This is completely decentralized. And it also, it, it's a very complex system, you know, the first it gets on a train and there's another guy will take it and take it to the neighborhood and another guy will take it and so on. And um, this may be the last stage, you know, in a little bite. And what is amazing also is that uh, as many of the Dabagualas, you know, uh, don't know how to read, they have developed this, this very beautiful system, you know, to, to, to encode both um, destination and, and point of, of pickup and destination of delivery. So maybe some last principles to, to finish up. The idea of including and not excluding people in, the, in these collaborative networks. This idea of bottom-up participation and not top-down control. The idea of flexible thinking and action, not linear planning. And the idea of thrift, thrift sorry, frugality and not really waste. To finish up, again, um, 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 sewing machine, sorry. Um, it was a very important technology. I think it's a technology, fabrication technology in a way or another, that really took off um, um, really fast at the beginning of the century, uh, you know, faster than the radio or the TV, you know, and it really changed the production model. I think it was really a disruptive innovation because for the very first time, uh, people were able to produce locally at home. So in a way, I can find some, some similar, similarities here with what we're discussing now. We'd like to finish with a quote from, from Gandhi, um, he wrote a book in 1913, 100 years back, it's called Hind Swarag, it's where he um, sets up, sets up sorry, the basis for Pacific resistance. And the last chapter is called Machinery, it's really criticizing the Industrial Revolution that the British was bringing into the, into the country. 
So he says, I want the concentration of wealth, not in the hands of a few, but in the hands of all. To gain machinery helps a few to write in the backs of millions. For instance, I will make intelligent exceptions. Take the case of the single seed machine. It is one of the few useful things ever invented, and there is a romance about the device itself. I think it was already pointed out to this idea that in this case, technology was really uh, helping the individual and not the industry as such. Um, maybe that's what we're looking at now, you know, with this mini revolution. And a few years' time, we'll also look at this, you know, as a, as a new sewing machine. Thank you.